Age of Anxiety. From the corner stool in my usual bar, I watch the ceiling TV talk of Grexit and shame and the despair of a generation, but also the rise of the new Greek poetry, and I think, hope among the ashes. Well, why not? It's like first reading Palados, uh, and the comfort of learning that 2,000 years ago, someone already felt the end had come. Are we not dead and only seem to be alive? He asked. Or are we alive and is life itself dead? The end of the pagan world, the birth of the new. Was there ever a darker loss? Words to deconstruct my young academic heart, freshly post-punk and all hungry for despair. But that was another bar, another place, getting fiercely drunk on black Russians while the embittered and tenured department chair whined, things used to be simpler. <laughs> well, they've never been simple, I cried and threw the old fart to an enraged and verminous mob, at least I should have, someone should have, these men, these captains who clutch the keys and seethe with all the wrong ideas. Do they really own us? Are there no shaggy-headed gods to strike them with scepters and drown them in the old port of Alexandria or drag them through the streets? and carve their flesh with the leftover clamshells of last night's feast. But the TV keeps ranting. It enjoins me to quail at the thought of a fractured world. Well, truth, silly word, is not some vaulted treasure, but the very weft of the cloth they baptize in public, porphyry to purple. It is the acrid smell of heated impure metal coming from the blacksmith's open door. Graceless. A man on a train sits alone with his thoughts. And as the train crosses a switch, its interior lights dim for just an instant. In that instant, without reason or warning, he knows that his life has gone all wrong. But he does not yet see why or how to make it right again. He has, in a sense, shed an old skin, and is about to emerge transformed. It has happened to each of us, for good or ill, this unannounced and irreversible moment when we first laid our eyes on our one true love, or when the bank said, no more, or when a feared illness was given a name. It leaves its print like blood on the brow of every human face, and it looms behind the man right now, a dark and rampant form, a rearing angel with wings outspread and jaws wide in an anticipation of the imminent feast. It is raining in his eyes, but dust is in the voice he hears imploring, don't hurt the angel, she's sad today. This is for my father. Snow Angels. Somewhere far upstream in my bloodline was a Viking who took a fancy to a Scotswoman ancestral to my father. Took a fancy or simply took, I'll never know. <laughs> but one way or another, he dove into my genetic backwaters and pissed in my gene pool. <laughs> I like to think about winter but this globally warmed version rarely delivers what I used to be used to. So it lives at the back of my memory, a wall of black ice and slush, plowed to the edge of the parking lot to keep the pavements clear for capitalism. My mother, at 17 the eldest, walking the bitter miles of road, snow cleared by a thousand mile wind, to light the schoolhouse stove and explain Fuhrer and Europe to the, so the kids would know where all the daddies and big brothers had gone. And my Oma before her, muttering through the snow in a Katrina Oblast to retrieve the severed toes of Opa's left foot. He hadn't spoken since the scarlet fever took his hearing, but he made much noise when the axe went astray on the downward arc. This kind and silent man, 
who touched my mother's throat to hear her when she sang, tapping his short boot in time. But they were safe from the Bolsheviks in Manitoba, and to celebrate, he would wake the children from their brick-warmed beds for one more song. Somewhere back up my bloodline was a Viking, and I prefer to believe that he actually fancied that bonny lass. It may have been in a peat hut under sleety rhyme, or under the pole star and an emerald sheet of aurora, but I am sure that they let themselves fall back into the unscribed powder, sinking half weight and barely breathing in that great northern hush, saying, are you ready? And with their upward eyes fixed on the pinhole night, they began slowly to fan their legs and arms. <laughs>